Welcome back to Real Peculiar, a podcast where we share and examine truly peculiar events and happenings. I'm your host, Bella. For those of you who haven't heard, or if you're a first-time listener, today's episode is an extra special one with an extra special guest. With us today, we have Morgan Ackerman. If that name doesn't ring a bell, his story may, especially for those of you who lived through the 90s. Since he's going to flesh it out for us in a moment, here's the gist. As a child, he got lost in an unfinished half of a mall in his hometown. Absolutely no one could find him. And then one day, he just reappeared, reporting some very strange happenings that occurred while he was away. All right, now let me stop myself here. You all know I could talk for hours. I mean, that's why this podcast exists, right? (laughs) So let's surrender the mic, so to speak, to our very special guest, Morgan Ackerman. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me, and thank you, Bella, for making this happen. It was a big story back then, but nowadays it's like no one cares anymore. Well, except fantastic podcasts like these. It is. It is a pleasure to have you. I'm so, so excited. This story has intrigued me for years, and I can't believe I'm getting to hear it straight from the source. As fans of Real Peculiar know, I love to talk. But today, you get to do the talking. This is your story. I'll ask questions if we need some clarification, but I think it's best to hear it right from the mouth of the person who experienced it without any interruptions. So once again, before I go off on a tangent, I'll turn things over to you. Tell us everything. All right. Well, this was back when I was seven years old, but don't worry, an experience like that you don't forget. It's still incredibly vivid in my head. Back in the 90s, malls were a big deal, especially if you lived out in the middle of nowhere Midwest. Having one built in our small town of Fieldvale was the most amazing thing to ever happen in the eyes of, I guess, nearly everyone there. The main part of the mall was complete, and the majority of the construction on the other half of it was as well, but no stores or anything had been established on that side yet. So, just the main area with the food court, the novelty-type shops, and the big-name businesses was accessible to the public back then. This place was packed, constantly, completely overwhelming, but it was exciting, fresh, and new. So everyone went anyway. My mom had taken me there a couple of times already, but I was always begging to go back. So after annoying her to no end, I finally got my wish. We went there right after she picked me up from school. It was late fall heading into winter, and I just remember the sun reflecting off of the massive windows at the entrance in this blindingly pink and orange hue, and even inside the tile flooring was lit up a soft pink from the sun. It was a nice contrast to the rest of the decorum, which was mostly flush white and had some cool accents of teal and purple. We ate at the food court. I got a big slice of that trashy, greasy pizza that every mall has, and a side of even greasier fries. After that, we explored the shops. I looked at toys, candy, video games. My mom was more interested in houseware, clothes, that kind of stuff. Anyways, we got my interest out of the way first, because of course I was annoying her about it, and then moved on to what she wanted. The moment I realized the fun was over and she was just looking for practical things we probably actually needed, I started dragging my feet, but I was still thankful she took me. So, with a little less complaining, I was right by her side as she went about her dull errands. That is, until we bumped into one of her friends. I was already exhausted, bored, and overwhelmed by the amount of people there, and was not looking forward to their conversation dragging out our already lengthy visit even longer. At first, I just tried to zone everything out and hope it would end soon, but they kept talking and talking. To keep myself distracted, I looked around, examining the mall more closely. I was usually too excited to really fully take it in. It was night outside at this point. The massive windows now just looked like black voids, with some rows of cars and lampposts floating out in the nothingness. Inside, the light was much more intense, but not warm. That cold, incredibly artificial glow of fluorescent lights, along with the neon teals and purples fitting the mall's theme. There were palm trees and various other plants scattered here and there, 
a fun novelty to have in the Midwest. And then there were the people. So many people. Felt like their voices were overtaking my entire sense of hearing, and being unable to piece together anything close to resembling a sentence, let alone a word, amongst the many conversations, made it even more overwhelming to me. My eyes wandered over to the other side of the mall, its entrance blocked off with black tarp, structured to stand in place with plywood beams. A small door sat at the center of all of this, propped ever so slightly open, allowing me to see in. It looked so calm inside there, like another world to escape to. Little did I know that my imagination wasn't far off, except it wasn't going to be a calming experience in the slightest. I figured I could get away from the noise and maybe just sit down for a second. I could still see my mom through the door if I left it propped open, so when she started looking for me, I'd run out and catch up to her. So I snuck away, not that it was hard considering how deep she and her friend were in their conversation. I looked around cautiously as I approached the door. I knew I wasn't supposed to be going in there, but I figured if I stayed near the entrance, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. I'd have to explain myself if I was caught, and knowing I didn't have a way with words or would probably just be too nervous to speak to someone I didn't know anyways, I figured it best not to be found out. Looking back and forth as well as behind me, I realized that everyone else was caught up in their own little worlds as well. So slipping inside was too easy. With my small body, I barely even had to move the door away from its wooden prop to squeeze inside. I immediately turned around to look out the door to make sure my mom was still there and hadn't seen me. With the combined satisfaction and comfort of seeing her, I turned back to the new space. It wasn't as open as I'd expected, more a large hallway or walkway splitting off into smaller ones than the grand open scheme of the food court outside. This area was more for smaller shops, offices, that kind of thing. It was entirely desolate besides a few decorations that had already been set up. Fake plants this time because there was a lack of windows on this side. A small fountain, not yet running, and a cushioned bench up against the wall. Seeing that bench made all the exhaustion from the day, the stress from being in a crowd for so long, weighed me down as I pictured myself sitting on it. I made my way over to the bench, but before actually sitting, turned around to the doorway, making sure I could still see through the crack to where my mom was. I could see her, but just barely, part of her side along with her arm which would occasionally be at rest before disappearing as she gestured in her conversation. I sat down with a sigh and leaned against the metal backing of the bench, incredibly uncomfortable compared to the padded but plasticky seating. I zipped up the windbreaker I'd left on since entering the mall. Even though it was toasty warm inside, tiredness was taking over, sending shivers down my back. I could actually hear the heaters in action, a constant rumbling hum in the background. It was odd that they were blasting out heat on the wrong side of the mall, but I didn't think much of it besides the fact that my nose was getting dried out, whistling with every breath. Wanting to feel a little more comfortable, I laid down on my stomach and peered out the doorway, watching my mom as I rested. The last thing I remember was the sound of my windbreaker and matching pants sliding against the plastic covering on the cushion from adjusting my body, and then I fell asleep. I awoke with a start and nearly rolled off the bench. I was immediately overwhelmed with a sense of panic and urgency, wondering how long I'd slept. The panic exploded into overwhelming fear and dread as I looked towards the door and realized that it was no longer even there. Not a door, not a doorway, just more tarp. I scrambled towards where the door used to be, my shoes skidding loudly across the floor and echoing down the empty hall. I pulled at the edges of the tarp, where it was stapled into the plywood, hoping I could either pull out the staples or rip the tarp open, but it was to no avail. I began to sob and clawed at the tarp before me helplessly. I tried to push against it, run into it and through it, any way to escape, but nothing was working. After I tired myself out and was able to tone down my crying somewhat, I rested my ear against the tarp to hear what was going on in the mall beyond. All I could hear was the distant music, that generic, copyright-free shopping mall music. But no talking, no more footsteps, nothing. I wondered if I'd slept past closing time and was the only one there, but I figured there at least had to be a guard or someone out there. I hoped. I yelled for help over and over, to no avail, until my voice was hoarse. I remember just sitting there for the longest time, completely unsure of what to do, 
until I finally pulled myself together and decided to explore this other side of the mall. There had to be some other way to get out. I decided my best bet was to walk down the main, wider section I was already in before heading off down any of the branching hallways. It looked very sterile, but also very complete for something still under construction. The walls were a blinding white, occasionally lit up with cool teal and purple from the placement of abstract neons as a way to continue the theme of the mall. The floor was pristinely polished, and my sneakers, much less white than I thought when compared to the floors beneath them, squeaked with nearly every step, echoing down the empty corridor. An overwhelming sense of aloneness began creeping back over me, the muffled music keeping away complete silence but almost making things even more eerie and uncomfortable. To distract myself, I peered into the mostly empty shops, like empty canvases or skeletons, waiting for the rest to be added. I tried to imagine what they'd become, and occasionally some would offer hints. These shops would have their roll-up gates down and locked with a variety of boxes and material stacked inside. I began to get the strangest feeling that I was being watched. Followed, even. The presence was familiar, but vague. I was hesitant at first, but that familiarity pushed me to turn around and investigate. That's when my heart dropped. There was a wall behind me. I turned around and around, trying to get my bearings, but everything seemed different. I wondered if I'd somehow gotten turned around or went a direction I didn't plan to while caught up in my imagination, but I recalled never turning and just going straight, only stopping on occasion to peer into a shop. I was in one of the smaller corridors now, and this area looked more for storage and small offices. The doors here were just that, normal metal doors, unassuming of what lay inside. I was too panicked to pay them much mind. I decided to head down one way to see if it got me back to the main corridor, or if not, go back the opposite way, because one way had to lead me back. I started running and running and running, but the corridor didn't seem to end. It just extended on and on. Out of breath and my heart pounding heavily from a combination of fatigue and fear, I turned around and ran the other way. There was no way I had gotten too far down the hallway without realizing it, so I had to have come from the opposite direction. Again, though, it was the same thing. It kept on going and going. Eventually, I just collapsed in defeat. My breath was shaking and my lungs were stinging with pain. I remember laying there crying for the longest time. And then, that presence returned, familiar, known but unknown. Along with it, though, was another one, and this one didn't feel good. The moment I felt it, all the fear returned to me. I felt hunted, in danger. I struggled to my feet and began to run again. With the presence growing closer and knowing the corridor wasn't going to end anytime soon, I began trying the doors on either side of the hallway. I'd rattle and pound on one and then move on to the next as quickly as I could, but one after the other was locked. I remember begging each door in my mind to please open as the presence grew closer and closer until finally I stumbled through a door that thankfully opened and tumbled onto the tile floor beneath. Clenching my teeth and trying to ignore the pain, I struggled to my feet yet again and turned around to close the door behind me, but there was a wall instead. I quickly scanned my surroundings to find I was in another hallway. It looked almost identical, the same plain doors, the white walls, blinding fluorescence above with cool teal and purple wall lights intermixed, and that ever-present dry, warm air. I heard the distant buzz of the heaters and even more distant, muffled, echoing music. The only difference was that the presence was gone, and I soon realized the floor was no longer pristinely polished but coated with a thick layer of dust, and those white walls were actually slightly yellowed. I brushed this dust off of my sweatpants and jacket, then smacked my hands together a few times to get rid of the rest. Looking ahead, I noticed a glowing light far down the corridor. Still out of breath, I walked slowly and unsteadily forward. As I grew closer, I realized what it was, a vending machine. My disappointment quickly turned to joy as I remembered I had some leftover pocket change. Although I should have been thinking about water, my mind was set on an ice-cold, sugar-filled soda. 
As I rushed towards the machine, I began to think about what I'd get. Cola, lemon lime, orange. But as I approached the machine, I realized that it only had one option. Something I'd never even heard of before called fresh or diet fresh. Thirsty, I shrugged it off and decided it was worth a try no matter what it was. The familiar clunk of a can dropping down into the dispenser filled my ears as I fed the machine some quarters and smacked one of the fresh buttons. The can I pulled out was not fresh at all. It was covered in dust, grime, and rusted at its top corners and down near the bottom. I cast it aside in disgust. That's when I noticed a nearby splashing and splattering sound. I turned my head and where there was once an extensive hallway, there was now an opening. I quickly rushed through it, not wanting to get caught up in the same situation as before, and found myself back where it all began. This time, though, the fountain was running, lights inside setting aglow the water, which was dyed a very unnatural blue. Fake tropical plants surrounded it, and a track of nondescript jungle noises played out of a speaker hidden amongst the fake leaves. I remembered a drinking fountain I'd seen earlier, and quickly rushed over to it to see if it was working. It was, and the water looked clean. I took a small, hesitant sip at first, unsure of what to expect after my experience with the vending machine. It was good, though, and I took one massive gulp after the other. I headed over to the water fountain and sat at its ledge, still trying to gather myself mentally and physically. That's when I noticed the shops had changed as well. They were still locked off by their roll-up gates, but inside were actual stores filled with clothes, tech, gadgets, books, movies. The place felt active, in use, but lacking any people. Deep down, though, I felt other presences, far more distant than the initial two, but still there. It was as if these were the people meant to be there, but they weren't at the same time, or at least were somewhere else. I couldn't decide if that made the situation slightly more comforting or more unnerving. While tapping into this feeling and continuing to survey my surroundings, that dark, sinister hunter presence returned, dominating and casting aside the rest. It was nearby and only growing closer. Not sure of what else to do, I ran from it again. On the run, I came across a simple metallic signpost standing up at the opening of one of the smaller corridors. The laminated page inside of it read, New slides and play area this way, with an arrow pointing down the hall. Rather than finding myself in a never-ending hallway again, I decided to follow its directions in hopes it'd lead me somewhere new. I soon lost the sensation of the presence following me, but continued at a quick pace knowing it could return anytime soon. I looked back over my shoulder to see if anything was there waiting for me, to discover yet another wall. I tried not to let the ever-changing corridors bother me and continue forth with my goal. I think there were at least two or three more signs and hallways before I finally reached it. I was in awe. The hallway opened up into a massive, lobby-like area similar to the one on the open side of the mall, possibly even bigger. It went upwards two levels, each with open-air balconies, and looked inwards to the extensive room. Above me was a large glass dome, an orange sky above, spotted with pink cotton ball clouds. It reminded me of when we'd first entered the mall, but I soon realized that it wasn't real at all. There was another dome of backlit artwork beyond the glass. At the center of the room, bask in the warm orange glow, was a series of winding, twisting, and curving slides. The jungle theme was even more present here. Fake palm trees, jungle underbrush, and a variety of waxy plastic flowers, mostly birds of paradise, were scattered around the play area, which was mostly just the slides but also had some swings, a rock climbing wall mixed in with various climbing nets, and some jungle animal-themed creatures you could pop some quarters into and ride. Beyond the ever-present music, which constantly echoed in the back of my head after entering this area, I began to hear occasional muffled voices, as if people were traversing this part of the mall, but in a slightly alternate space, either between or next to the one I was in. Present but distant, unreachable. Comforting but with an underlying sensation of fear, just like before. To get my bearings, I decided to walk my way around the entire room, checking for possible exits or pathways that may lead to an exit. To my dismay, the majority of the exits from this room were either gated off or had a similar tarp-like cover structured onto wooden framing like the one I'd first passed through to enter this side of the mall. 
My hopeless expectations were justified when I tried to pull these gates up and tear through the tarp with no avail. My spirits dropped even further after I'd realized I'd not only looped around the whole room, but the initial entrance into the room was no longer even there. My heart pounded for a few moments, but at this point I was almost becoming used to the ever-shifting environment, expecting it to change, and besides, I couldn't panic. I needed to save my energy in case whatever it was that was following me returned. Taking a break to both gather myself and to think of something new, I turned back to the looming play area before me. Some of the slides were surprisingly large and winding, especially the black one that seemed to curve around and encompass as much of the open space as possible. Upon closer observation, I realized the slide had tiny holes all over the top and sides, not large enough to affect its integrity, but plentiful. I wondered what their purpose was as my eyes followed the slide from its bottom, hidden in the fake jungle, up to where its entrance was on the second floor. Looking up there, I decided it best to search the other two levels for possible paths out. Exhausted from all the running and wandering, I was happy to find an elevator near the back of the room, which I didn't remember seeing previously. I was just concerned it wouldn't work. I figured I could at least give it a try, though, so I made my way to its doors and pressed the up arrow at their sides. It gave me a happy ding and the metallic door slid open. I got inside and pressed 2, deciding to start from the top and work my way down. I watched Zero quickly flash to 1 on the digital screen above the elevator doors. That subtle vertigo from the movement causing my stomach to tingle. The vibrant teal lights inside the small mirrored capsule I was contained within flickered and suddenly I was entrapped in a darkness even deeper than the purple tile beneath me. My heart pounded and I reached for the railing, which went around the elevator's walls. Being able to feel that I was still there, rather than in some lifeless black void, made me feel slightly more secure. But my heart pounded faster and faster as realization set in. If the elevator didn't start moving again, I had no way of getting out of there. Even if I pressed the emergency button, there was no one there to come for me, wherever I was. It seemed I was the only one physically there. The lights came back to life with an electric buzz and the elevator lurched slowly upward. I whispered thank you repeatedly beneath my breath, while simultaneously hoping I'd make it to the second floor. I did, and with a much weaker, pathetic, long, and drawn-out ding, if it could even be called that, the elevator doors squealed open. I got out as quickly as I could, assuring myself I'd use stairs from then on out. I did a similar loop around this level as I'd done on the base floor, and quickly realized the top only had storefronts in the slide entrance. I had another floor to go, but my hope was completely lost at that point. I began to sob, wondering if I'd ever make it out of that place, or if not, how I could ever survive there. I'd found water, but what about food? It was just all too much for me. I remember for a brief moment I considered jumping over the railing. It seemed my only escape, but after resting my hands atop it and looking down over the play area, those thoughts were pushed back by pure shock. Beneath me was a mess of trash and old, broken store items strewn about everywhere. The ceiling above was caving in, glass paneling and ceiling tiles lay broken and bent on the floor below. Real light shone through the cracks in the painted dome. Mold, dust, and grime coated everything. The jungle animal rides were all on their sides, some more broken than others. But the slides remained intact, beyond the colorful mess of graffiti coating them. After adjusting to my new, or rather old, decaying surroundings, motivation and excitement suddenly overtook me when I noticed something strange about the black slide. Its end was no longer in the play area, but instead the slide seemed to go through the wall at the base floor. I somehow just knew this had to be the exit. I just promised myself I'd only be using the stairs, but this slide had to be an exception. I rushed to its entrance and pushed myself through without hesitation. My nose immediately filled with the smell of artificial mint as I entered the slide, overpoweringly strong, but... I soon forgot all about it when I picked up speed. This was when I realized what the holes in the slide were for. As I slid faster and faster downwards, my body giving way to the curves, bends, and bumps, the pinholes of light piercing through the utter blackness that surrounded me 
made it look as though I was traveling through space and they were stars. I was in awe at first. It was truly beautiful. But the slide continued onwards and onwards as if it was never going to end. The same trap sensation I felt in the elevator returned. Again, I was alone in darkness, unsure if I'd make it out. Suddenly, it was as if my own voice was speaking to me. My own mind, my thoughts were yelling for me to stop. I sat up and pressed my hands and shoes against the walls of the slide to squeak and skid to a halt. Somewhere beneath me, further down the slide, I sensed that hunter presence. I quickly rolled over onto my stomach and struggled to climb back upwards. I paused from my struggles, hearing a scuffling blow and sensed the familiar presence as well. It was helping me, fighting for me. Those thoughts that were both mine but not returned, this time saying for me to go as fast as I could. I could pass while the scuffle continued. I quickly sat back down, gave the hardest push I could against the slide with both hands, and plummeted downwards on my back. Both presences felt closer and closer until I was on them. I crashed into both of them. They were there but not there, as if I was being dragged through mud rather than hitting an actual physical form. A spindly clawed hand, more like a shadow, barely even detectable in the darkness but somehow even darker than what surrounded me, reached out towards me. My soul felt as if it was being ripped from my body. It quickly returned, though, and all the pain from it subsided. Hearing the struggling and scuffling dim away behind me as my speed returned, I knew that whatever or whoever that familiar presence was had saved me. I hoped it was okay and thanked it in my thoughts. The little stars above me streaked by like meteors, and suddenly I was enveloped in blinding white light. The next thing I remember is rolling across the floor and crashing into a metal door that swung open with a loud bang. As my eyes adjusted to the artificial light, I realized that there were multiple faces looking down at me, asking if I was okay. I just remember pleading for help before passing out. I'm sure you've probably heard the rest. After days of searching for me, first at the mall, both the side under construction and the open half, finding no trace of me, and then moving on to the surrounding area, the police, family, family friends, and neighbors had nearly all but given up hope of finding me. Then out of nowhere, people said I came crashing through the door I'd first entered into and was sent to the hospital after they couldn't get me to wake back up. There was constant questioning and, being a kid, I figured complete honesty was my best bet, but it was so unbelievable to anyone asking that they thought it was all something I'd made up in my head out of trauma or perhaps hallucinations. They couldn't come up with any good explanation as to why they couldn't find me, even though I was not only in the mall the whole time, but in the construction area where the workers would come and go from daily. Eventually, everyone gave up on attempting to explain it and just figured I was some dumb kid that wandered away from mom who couldn't figure out how to get back to her. Wow. So you heard it here on Real Peculiar. That's Morgan Ackerman's incredible story firsthand. So, I mean, to me, that seems real, very real. But does all the doubt and the fact that the official story ignores nearly every single thing you recall make you feel like it was something you imagined? I'd like to say not a doubt in my mind because I know it has to be true. I mean, I was there, physically there, wherever there was, but to be honest, yeah, I've second-guessed it plenty. I actually used to have to go to therapy for what happened, and all they did was try to repress it and tell me it was only real in my mind. You know, classic psych stuff when they have no idea how else to deal with you. As a kid, of course, I was gullible enough to try to get into that mindset they wanted, along with the help of all of the different drugs that they prescribed me. But now, I know it's just because they don't want to accept the truth and would rather have it suppressed, you know? That's why I'm going back. Yes, that's right! Exciting news, everyone! This is a two-parter. Next time, we're live. We'll be streaming directly from Morgan's perspective as he returns to the location of this peculiar occurrence for the first and most likely 
final time. Yeah, I'm not sure what we'll see, but I'm hoping it'll provide some answers, or at least some confirmation. The Diamond Mall is shutting down permanently in the coming weeks, but is still open to the public for probably only a couple of stores making their final closeout sales. I just need to go before it's gone. I have to. And I'm very thankful for the support and interest from everyone. I can't wait. Thanks for sharing your story and this whole upcoming experience with us. Well, that's it for today. For any skeptics listening, hold out on your judgment until next time. And for those of us waiting for the truth to be officially documented, let's hope we get it all live. I'm your host, Bella, and that was Morgan Ackerman telling his story. And this has been Real Peculiar, your source for hearing and getting down to the details of truly peculiar real-world events and occurrences.